Hello, everyone. It's certainly great to be be to, back today. <laughs> the time passes fast, but you know, when you're gone a week, it uh, you can certainly tell. It. <clears throat> and I'm glad this is a warm, warm day. Uh, I don't think we need to wear it. Glad of this warm day too, uh, because I know it won't be long till it'll be cold days, and I'm not looking forward to that. But today I want to speak on a subject we're all familiar with, maybe too familiar sometimes, and that is fear. <clears throat> and I kind of, I think we find ourselves today in a, another pandemic, a pandemic of fear with all that's happening in the in our country, indeed in the world. And uh, there's so much distrust and uh, misinformation. You can't, you can't really <clears throat> trust the news you're hearing. You can't trust many of our institutions to put out the truth. I know my wife does get sometimes kind of startled by things she'll hear, and I have to remind her, well, may or may not be the truth. You can't take it for the truth anymore, <clears throat> especially things you hear on the news and TV. In fact, one of the things the uh, we've all been bombarded with the numbers of corona deaths, coronavirus deaths. I think I don't know what it's up to now. I know 180,000 a while back they were saying 180,000, but then the CDC quietly put out a kind of a qualifier. They they put out that actually less than 10,000 of those deaths were coronavirus deaths by itself. The, the vast majority, over 90% of them, were what they call comorbidities. In other words, people had heart failure, they had uh, pneumonia, they had strokes, whatever, old age. They died with COVID, but not necessarily of it. And so the same people are putting out the, the numbers for the, the 180,000 are also put out the qualifier, which news media didn't pick it up. But it still can be a serious thing, and it's it's one of those things that cause causes you know to to worry. <clears throat> and if that's not enough, then we have the uh, so-called protesters, peaceful protesters. We have all these peaceful protesters, and uh, if you watch your TV, pretty much it doesn't look all that peaceful. We see. Uh, we see them uh, burning, looting, and attacking, you know, people, people on the street, policemen, uh, federal buildings, police precincts. And we see all that, and uh, then we see the reaction by some of the mayors and governors, <clears throat> which invariably uh, they react by blaming the president and their solution is defund the police. And it kind of makes your head spin a little bit. And I can understand that people are getting very frustrated, very upset, very fearful, in fact, fearing for our nation. <clears throat> but you know, fear is it's kind of a natural emotion. We all have it. It's part of our flight or fight or flight uh, reaction to danger. And it, it can, you know, it can be a good thing, and that way it could protect you. But what we're seeing is not that kind of fear. It's a, it's a propagated fear. It's a, they try to promote panic and, and uh, just, I don't know, uh, it's like a phobia fear, which can be destructive and unhealthy. It just gets, keeps people upset all the time about what's, what's happening. <clears throat> And sometimes the fear can take control of our lives, which it, it has in this country. It's, it's taken control of a lot of people's lives. And it can even cause us to miss out on many of the joys of life. Fresh air, for one thing. <laughs> You're walking around in a mask, you don't get much of it. We, people get afraid of leaving their homes, uh, afraid of getting sick. And of course, the big fear, I guess, that we've always had is the fear of death. 
and the unknown. What what will happen? What's going to happen when we die? Are we going to, you know, burn in hell? Some people have that fear, I would think. Are they just going to be dead and never, never heard from again? Never, just wiped out? Never, never hear? Or some people think, well, if I'm good enough, I, I will go to heaven. So it's the fear of death is probably the big one. But I don't think most of us in here have that uh, terrible fear of death. We don't look forward to it, of course. And if we're knowledgeable of God's word and his plan of salvation, of course it will soften that fear. We may still dread the pain of death. I mean, we don't want to be sick to death. It's a pretty, pretty bad thing. But we won't be terrified of death. <clears throat> We'll, we'll have an idea of what's going to happen afterwards. Uh, let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2, 14. <clears throat> okay. Verse 14, Since the children have flesh and blood... He too, talking about Christ, shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And he holds the power of deceptions too and he's very good at his work. And to free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. <clears throat> so uh, if you understand enough about Christ you'll be freed from the terror of death well let's, let's turn over to the same book turn over to chapter 13 chapter 13 verse 6 <clears throat> verse 6 so we say with confidence the Lord is my helper I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? And of course, uh, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of a lot of threatening and beating people up, even even killing people. That's what man can do to you. But he can't he can't destroy your soul. But they can destroy your physical life. So we need to know these things, and I'm sure that we do. But not everybody in the world does. <clears throat> But you know, uh, like I say, some fear is normal, has its place. And of course, the fear of the Lord, we should have that, a respectful fear. We, you know, when we were young, we, we had that respectful fear for our parents, uh, hopefully. I, I think we all did. You know, if you did wrong, you, you was going to have to settle up, and you, it wasn't going to be fun. <clears throat> In Psalms 111 and 10, we don't have to turn there. I think we're all familiar with it. It tells us that the fear of Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you got a, a fear and respect of, of the Lord and a knowledge of Him and a knowledge of His Word. If you don't have that, you're not even going to have the beginning of wisdom. <clears throat> but let's do turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter uh, 2 and 17. Actually, I'm going to start in 15. For it is, verse 15, um, chapter 2, verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. So we should do good. Let it Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. This is all important. Respect, treat your fellow man as yourself. In other words, the golden rule. And love, love your fellow man, love and respect. And then fear God, honor the king. Fearing God is a good thing. Fear and respect. It's not terror. We're not terrorized of God because we know God. We know he's... He's a loving, forgiving God. And we're very fortunate in that respect. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 
chapter 4, verse 16. <clears throat> find where I'm at in a minute. Verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love of God, the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we, we are like him. There is no fear in love and perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment so if we're living a life of perfect love if we're living within inside God's laws and we're love we love and obey God we love one another we're not in danger of condemnation at that point and uh, so it helps us to cope with a world like we live in today you know where there's so much uncertainty we don't know what's going to happen we know there's very evil people trying to gain control of of uh, government of the entire country and the entire world, really. So, <clears throat> final thought is, if we fear God and keep His commands, we will be free of many illogical and ignorance-based fears, and we can face life with uh, renewed faith, hope, and love. Thank you. Ten Days of Sincerity. That's the title, 10 Days of Sincerity. They ask kids about characteristics of God in a church school setting. And, and the kids all had different things. He's kind, he's powerful, you know, uh, all-knowing. And one little girl says, and he's also jealous. And actually, that's a true statement. You'll see in the beginning of Nahum, Nahum one of the minor prophets, and it's, it's in a lot of the uh, books of the Bible. The, the God is jealous. Um, in a sense, God said, I've chosen you. And he demands that we choose him and that we're loyal to him. And God does it for our own good because he understands that if we choose something besides God to follow, we'll end up following this world. And you know who is the biggest influence in this world? Um, and of course, in Israel's case, the pagan, let me just describe the ancient world a little bit. We probably know it, but it's good to remind ourselves. In the ancient world, they had a lot of food insecurity and other insecurities because they didn't have a lot of the technology for food storage. I could, you could elaborate. If you had a bad harvest, you might starve to death. If your neighboring little kingdom defeated you, a whole lot of bad things could happen to you. A lot of bad things. Um, they were very superstitious. Um, a lot of athletes are superstitious. Get luck decides whether you win or lose. You can understand it. So, and without a knowledge of the true God, you know, some priest comes along and says, "Well, you know, there's a God of war, uh, Mercury, or if, if it's something to do with the sea, uh, you know, the God of the sea, Neptune." Uh, and of course, maybe the big one was the sun god. And then you, you could rattle off a bunch of others. Uh, uh, <clears throat> then there was, under various names, there was a god, goddess of sex and fertility because you needed kids for war and for farming. And uh, you, you get, and if you didn't have fertility and your crops failed, well, people were very superstitious. And they would do things. Uh, actually, I'm reading this book about what America was like before Christopher Columbus came. At least two of the major civilizations taught this. The guy is rather evil and clever. They taught that the sun god needed the blood of human victims to power him from crossing the sky. And they knew if you don't have sunlight, you don't have crops, you all starve to death. So they were saving the environment by Sacrificing people, you know, they, well, there are different ways to sacrifice them, I'm the details, but, and including sacrificing babies. They actually thought they were doing it to appease the gods who were, if you didn't appease them with that kind of stuff, bad things would happen. So God had a lot of good reasons for being jealous of his people to keep them away from all the pagan influences. And, you know, they, they 
they combine two powerful forces, sex and religion, and um, all kinds of uh, temple prostitution, male and female. You can imagine the bad influence that is on a society. And so God demands putting nothing between him and us. Well, the 10 days between the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Atonement, we should focus on our sincere relationship with God and try to get close to God. Because atonement is about being at one with God. And that's the goal, to be at one with God as close as you can. Um, you remember when a man told Jesus, I did a lot of religious works in your name, and Christ told him, get away from me, I don't know you. Well, the guy may have done religious stuff, but he had no relationship with Christ. He didn't know you. We need to develop a sincere relationship with God. And from the beginning, God has always loved mankind and wanted that kind of relationship. I want to read Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7. Uh, this is also mentioned in the New Testament, but often people misunderstand it. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord our God, and that could be translated Yahweh or Jehovah, is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. In other words, that's the goal, for us to love God with all our heart. God loves us. We need to love him back with all our heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Verse 6, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Try to pass them on to the next generation. As they say, that is one of the problems of the world. The next generation has rejected their parents' standards and they're being led by radical, secularists, humanists, Marxists, and it's um, not good. But teach them to your children uh, to your children diligently, you shall talk with them, sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, be focused on God all the time. Isaiah 51 7. Isaiah 51 7. This is a slightly different translation. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. One way to, to put God in our heart is to put God's law in our heart. Don't you fear the re don't you fear the reproach of men? Neither be you dismayed at their insults. Just like uh, Mr. Hill said, don't fear men. We should love God and fear God more. In other words, put God's law in our heart and don't fear men. And that fits very well with the two holy days coming up. Trumpets is about God's victory to take over this world. And then atonement, removing anything between man and God, so we're at one again. Right now, we, a lot of people fear men. We fear the world, which is heavily influenced by Satan. And you can see it even pressing against Christianity. It's becoming more obvious now, um, no less those who really, really get into the Bible deeply. We need to love God with all our hearts. So what stands in the way of between man and God? Two things, our carnality and Satan and all of his influence upon society. Two things, our carnality and Satan's influence on all society. Uh, we have to resist Satan's pressure. Um, and Satan wants us to kind of put God in a box. You know, put your religion in a little box, set it on the side, don't let it get in the way. You hear people talk, you know, well, you know, you can't let your religious views affect the way you do this, the way what you teach your kids. You know, put God in a little box on the side, if at all. Go with the majority. Whatever is in, or I guess the new term is woke. Whatever is woke at the moment. Ten days between trumpets and atonement. And in those ten days, um, we should be talking to Jesus Christ who covers our sins and who's going to lock up Satan and try to develop a closer, more sincere relationship with Christ. And the holy days are a guide to the future. Um, <clears throat> and so the two holy days show the Christ victory and the Satan will be locked up. Um, 
as GTA said, Satan is our partner in crime. I think we can easily see his effect on the world. We can look at the cities that are in crisis. For instance, I saw this on the, I forgot whose TV show it was, but they were saying New York is about to collapse. And many of the insiders in New York are worried about it. And they're talking to the mayor and the governor. We've got to do something. Uh, people are moving out of the city. Uh, businesses that would normally reopen are saying, I'm getting out of here. This get, the streets are getting too dangerous. By the way, New York is America's biggest city. It's the financial capital of the world. And a lot of the things you could say about New York, the news center of the world, it's an important city. Um, I mean, I hope it doesn't collapse, but in Portland, can't you see the devil behind all that? Can't you kind of, I know we can't see the spirit world, but can't you sense the devil is behind chaos in New York City? And we're told they're going to bring a lot of chaos to Washington, D.C. In about a week or two, they're planning it, um, different groups. Well, Revelation 20, verse 1, Revelation 20, verse 1. <clears throat> Angel came down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil, Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut a seal on him. And it says he's going to be locked up. He'll be released for a little while, maybe to test those in the end of the millennium, and then locked back up again forever. So Satan is going to be locked away. And the Day of Atonement is about two goats. Uh, one goat represents the Lord, and his blood covers the sins of the whole nation of Israel. It's kind of a national day of um, reconciliation. And eventually that'll be the whole world. And the other goat represents Satan, the devil, and his seditious evil influence on the world. I'm going to go to Leviticus 6.21. Um, Leviticus 6.21. And Aaron shall lay both hands on the heads of the live goat, confess over him all the sins of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, put him on the head of the goat, and send him away by the hand of a chosen man into the wilderness. So one goat blood covers sin and the other goat the high priest lays his hands on the goat and says the sins of Israel are on you then the strong man takes him out to the wilderness you know they're in the desert so way out so he'll never get to come back to the people again he's put away there's the obvious parallel between Satan and the bottomless pit and the second goat and being led into the hot desert wilderness um, Verse 22, and the goat shall bear on him all the sins to a land in which no one lives. He goes into the wilderness. And that parallel is obvious, you know, from Leviticus to Revelation. The wilderness, bottomless pit. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how the devil is to blame for the sins of mankind. Let's say a con man came along. And you're working at a company that has a lot of cash in it. And the con man knows that you're greedy and you lack real honesty. And he plays on your greed and your vanity and your, and your lack of real, you know, when nobody's looking, you're not quite so honest. And he kind of knows and he plays on it. Your boss is really, you know, some bad name, whatever, you know, he doesn't deserve this profit. It really, you know, you give him an excuse to appeal to his greed and dishonesty. And he sets up a scheme to defraud the company. Well, obviously, the con man is the, and he gets most of the money, he's to blame, but he used the weakness that he sensed in the employee that we're talking about. So they're both guilty, but, it, but probably the, uh, the embezzling would never have happened if the con man hadn't come along to this uh, vulnerable employee, you know, played on his vanity and his... Um, greed and got him to do what he did. So I think that's the way the world is. You could look at people in a general sense, especially as they grow up, young men, maybe especially, but young women, maybe different kind of things. And you can see if you start influencing them with different bad things, one of those things they're going to take up with, right? 
and then you got them. And maybe some people are more into this, more into that, but one bad thing or another. Um, and Satan knows what he's doing. So we should take this 10 days of sincere repentance for our part in letting Satan lead us into sin and learn to be on guard against Satan's world and on guard against whatever frailties our human nature presents for him to target. Uh, I want to tell you a corny story. It kind of makes a point. It's called the firehouse dog. A grandfather sitting on the porch with his grandkids, and here comes a fire truck, you know, lights flashing, it roars down, and he sees in the front row a Dalmatian next to the guy driving the fire truck. And the grandkids says, what's, what's the um, Dalmatian for? And uh, one kid says, well, they use him for crowd control, the bark and scare to get the people out of the way. Uh, no, no, no. Another one says, uh, he's there for good luck. No, 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 no. The other one says, I know what he's there for, to find the fire hydrant. <laughs> and uh, now I'm going to use this analogy in, that, in this way. Fire hydrants have a smell to dogs because so many dogs have left their scent on it, if you know what I mean. They leave their scent on it. Well, in a sense, we can sense the devil's mess, can't we? Just like the dog can sense various scents put on the fire hydrant by other dogs, we can sense the devil's mess. We can't see the spirit world, but you know it's there. You think of all the horrible things that have happened in world history, some may be long term, others sudden, but you know the devil had to be behind the scenes, egging people on. Uh, we, we told this story before how, before World War I, they thought they were too smart, too educated, and too diplomatic for a big war. Boom, they got caught up in it almost against, well, it, it, un, they said, the Germans said, well, we can't stop the mobilization now. Uh, and then the other side, well, they're mobilizing, the Russians, we got, and they're four, they're all uh, in the meat grinder of four years, millions of men, some like a million men dying for five miles in the front. Weird, you know, and, and that's when a lot of other horrible things started in the world. Well, you know the devil had to be behind that. And, um, and I think because of that, God can be sympathetic human beings because we're just flesh and blood. We have potential weaknesses that can be exploited. Um, and we're easy to mislead. I mean, you look at, especially younger people. I'm not saying older people can't be misled. But I'm thinking about myself when I was young. I wasn't as crazy as some of these kids are now. But I, but I could easily miss. You're not so balanced and wise. And you can just think of these colleges that are teaching this weird stuff. And a lot of it's in high school and, and they're gang leaders and all kind of bad influences from Hollywood. And you can see the kids are like easy to get them doing bad stuff. And if you tell them you're good when you burn down that statue and they deserve to have these stores looted. I mean, they got kids doing bad stuff thinking they're doing good. They're e people are easy to mislead. So during our 10 days, we should thank God that we're not so easily misled and try to show sincere appreciation for what, well, God the Father, by letting his son die for us and what his son did dying for us in a very tough way, show sincere appreciation for Christ. Try to increase our love of God. Second Peter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter 1 verse 2 Peter 1 verse 3 and 4 and as his divine power has given to, to us all that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises precious promises that through these you may be the partakers of divine nature. we we'll read that sentence again. That you, meaning us believers, true believers, you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. 
Think about that. We're going to be part of the divine nature. God will give that to us, remove our human nature if we just hang in there. You know, and part of, people ask the question, well, why did God let Satan into the Garden of Eden? He could have just kept him out. He could keep him away from us. I mean, someday he will be locked away uh, and, um, and all that. I think in part, because we have such a bright future for all eternity, which is hard to even imagine, God's letting us learn tough lessons. It's sort of like muscles. You know, the bill muscles, you have to have resistance, you know, heavy weights, resistance, strings, and all those things. And you know, what you do is you work hard, and then you let your muscle rest with good nutrition, and it gets tougher, and you know, within certain limits. Um, I think men can build bigger muscles than women because of some various hormones, but you know what I mean. You work it, you work it, and you'll get, depending on your genetics, and you know, you'll, you'll get stronger. Well, spiritually, I think God wants us to learn to recognize evil and to learn to resist evil because our reward is that great. It's worth it for God to allow that to happen. And, and one thing you have to admit when you read the Bible, God will test people. We were speculating a little bit last night. I think it was on the podcast or before the podcast. Can't remember which. We we joke around before the podcast for about 30, 40 minutes too. We said, well, about the angels that went astray, it seems logical that God probably didn't have anything to fear from Satan and his rebellion. And he surely saw it coming. God could have intervened and stopped it. Our supposition was, God said, well, let's just see which angels will remain loyal and which ones won't. And of course, he found out about a third of them went with Satan, and I'm sure they regret it to this day. But the point is, uh, God even tested the angels. And probably after that, and you know, maybe it was all planned, you know, God realized that he wanted sons who learned to resist evil. So as horrible as Satan is, God is using him. I know that may, that may sound odd, and, and he's using Satan, and, and in the near future, Satan will be removed and locked away. But for now, we have to try to suck it up and resist. Resist the world that wants us to uh, put God in a secondary role, if at all. Second Peter 1.5, but also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control. Here's the kind of muscle he wants us to build. You're going to have more virtue, more knowledge of God, more self-control. To self-control, control, perseverance. We can, we can hang in there for the long run. We don't give in easy. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. You know, remember when Christ said to love your enemy? We always thought, well, he's doing that for the sake of the enemy. He's really doing it for our sake. He'll worry about them in the next resurrection. And when you learn to be nice to the person that's talking about you behind your back, that's a really great character trait. It's not natural um, to brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. Um, and in verse 9 through 11, 2 Peter 1, 9 through 11, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten he was cleansed of sin. So we need not to forget that God, through the blood of Christ, and that's half of what atonement's about, Jesus Christ, the first goat. And he was cl cleansed from his old sins. And don't forget when we get those 10 days that we've been clean from sin. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure. Diligent. We can kind of focus on God and everybody, if they're really honest, we're really not diligent as much as we should be. And it's hard to be diligent in a world that, eh, I'll take it easy, and lay on the couch, I don't think I want to go to church, I don't think I want to do this, I don't want to do that. And I, I do understand it. Um, um, 2 Peter 3.14, uh, Peter writes the same thing again. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent, diligent, 
to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, to try to reduce the sin in our lives as much as we can. Ten days, September 19th to September 28th. That's next, well, actually it starts at sunset next Friday all the way to um, sunset on the 28th. Um, we should be diligent. We should try to spend more time with God. Think about that. Spend more time with God. Um, maybe during those 10 days, spend more time reading the Bible and other things that you think are helpful and uplifting. Maybe a little less TV and wild music or whatever. A lot of music is getting wilder. People even complain about country music isn't as country as it used to be. I guess that's a matter of opinion, but that's what I hear from people. Um, praying, listening to godly music, maybe some DVDs that are out there that we have. Actually, we have stuff online, too, that you can look at. Um, we have the icgarea4.com website and the ICG YouTube, I think it's .org. But if, but if not, you can check around. I think you have to spell out the words intercontinental, uh, churchofgod.org, and, and then it comes up on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> I guess we don't qualify high enough to get abbreviations from YouTube. Because you'd be surprised. ICG is an abbreviation apparently used by a lot of people on YouTube. So what can I say? It didn't work out for us that regard. But anyway. But there are a lot of good stuff out there that we can look at during those 10 days. In conclusion, we should try to be honest with God. You know, we haven't done as well this year probably as we could have done. Uh, but he loves us and he understands. And Christ knows what it's like to be human and weak. He understands our weaknesses. Confess our sins to God. He died for us and tell him we want to try harder to make God number one. We want God to be number one in our lives, number one. Say to God um, that um, you want his help and you want to work with him and, and his help in helping us do better next year. So um, Atonement 2020 to Atonement 2021 will have a better year. This is kind of like the civil new year and the way those things are set up. Um, and because we're so thankful for this divine opportunity.